The scripture you have in the bulletin is wrong. Now the scripture I'm going to tell you is in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's in Isaiah chapter 26. Beware of the pastor that can't keep his notes straight. Chapter 26, verse 1. I think it's verse 1. Oh, okay, yeah. Now, in that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. My friends, I believe we are in that day right now. When Jesus came preaching, he said the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. And the kingdom of God is right here, right now. It's not entire. <laughs> it's not complete. But it's here. Okay? The kingdom of God is here. Now, we are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Here's the historical context. Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, is under siege by the Assyrian army. And by siege, I mean that they would take rocks and sand and work, and they built great ramps. You can go look up in your Bible and look at the Google list, and you can find all kinds of siege ramps. You didn't just go and knock down the walls. It took months and weeks and years to build ramps. And all the time you could watch as you stood inside the walls, you could see out there the enemy was building ramps and building up walls, to do, building up ramps and workways so they could come and destroy you and kill you. And so you watched as they built up their tents. You watched as they, de they destroyed the land by eating everything in sight and killing anybody that opposed them. And they just invaded something kind of like the southern border. I'm sorry. No, I'm not really, but it's kind of like that. It was an invasion. It was a, they were invading, and you could watch it. You could go out on the wall and you could see it coming. And when they did get you, when the Assyrians got you, they didn't just play with you. They took, if you were a man like this young man right over here, one of the head of that family, they'd take you to pay you on a pipe or a stick and put you up, hang you up somewhere. And they didn't work, work very nice to ladies either and children. Anyway. That's what they're talking about. But there's a contrast. God's walls are salvation. So he says, open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All those whose heart thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always. For the Lord God is the eternal rock. He humbles the proud and brings down the arrogant city. He brings it down to the dust. The poor and oppressed trample, trample it underfoot, and the needy walk all over it. My friends, there's a verse of scripture I found in one of the translations. It says, He will lift the shroud that is all on all people. He will lift the shroud. Let me tell you what that shroud It's an image of the brokenness of our world. The brokenness that exists in our world today. I, I remember sitting in my dorm room and this young man sat on the bed, on my bed. His skin, he had some kind of a disease of his skin and it, it flaked just like the skin on an onion. Have you had dinner yet? <laughs> And you know, everybody in the dorm made fun of him and poked fun at him. And he said to me, he said, Fred, I don't like my condition. I wish I wasn't like this. And he told me about his cleaning habits and how he tried to, how he kept himself clean, probably more clean than any of the other guys in that dorm floor in Ormson Hall. Oh my God. And at the same time, he told me how serious it was <laughs> for him. He was outside because of his skin condition. And then also I remember at youth camp at a youth uh, rally where this 
somebody or Lord or she said, if you just had enough faith, you'll be healed of anything. And they were preaching that kind of stuff. And uh, this young kid would pray and check his arm. It was all crippled up from birth. All crippled. He couldn't straighten it. He had to play ball with just one arm. It was all crippled up. And he prayed and felt his arm. Prayed and felt his arm. I don't think he ever did get really healed from it. My friends, there's a shroud over this whole world, this whole universe. I even feel it. You know, I, I make the joke at my house, I've got to, I've, if I've got to leave for some place, i got to start turning this early. You know why? I've got to ask my wife where the car keys are. <laughs> i got to make sure i got gas in my wallet. I mean, like, money in my wallet. <laughs> She'll tell me goodbye about four times and kiss me about five. <laughs> and, but, and, or, and tell, you know, I lost something. I lost a knife for, what, about two weeks. I grieved over that. I lost a knife. A buck knife. You don't lose buck knives. You'd have to be an idiot to lose a buck knife. <laughs> and I just looked all over, looked all over, and we just searched the house. Brokenness, my friends. There's a shroud. And if you think you're the perfect one, let me guess again. You're not the perfect one. There's every one of us has something about us, a shroud over us. I was in therapy for my arm, not for my arm. <laughs> I was I was in therapy for my arm. And I I She's the uh, therapist. I said, I bet your husband's a doctor. And all she said, my husband died. Well, he did? Yeah. I said, he was a paraplegic. All their married life, he was, he was in a wheelchair. And she tended to him day after day in a wheelchair as a wife tending her husband. And she said, when he died, she said, you don't know the celebration we had. You know why? The shroud had been lifted. The shroud had been lifted. This man no longer was in a wheelchair. This man was running, praising, rejoicing in God. The shroud had been lifted because of Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, I want you to know there's three things I want you to leave with today. One is the word is redemption, and I want you to hold on to the word of weight and also for purpose. And my whole goal is that when you come out of here today, you'll be like our pastors that preach it, that you get it all in for God. Not legally, not religiously, but in your heart you'll be all out for God and a love for God. And so my friends, God's final word is redemption. And he will put whatever necessary into our lives into our experiences for us to be redeemed, to be a part of his family, not just members of a church, not just sitting around and saying, oh yeah, I'm a member of the Blue Water Free Methodist Church, been there for years. No, it'll be people that'll be in us that you say, well, I've been in the way for years. Well, get out of the way and start living for Jesus. And so there'll be a, a a submission to the love and the greatness of God. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll yeah, pray. Uh, hey, will you, the young man there, I know your name. I should know it. Will you pray I won't get silly in the sermon? Will you pray? <laughs> Excuse me. Now, what word I want you to know is wait. I like that word. It's in the King James. And what it means is this. You become strong and twisting by being braided. By twisting together, you become strong. One little cord of two pound feet. We did this in our grief class one day. And uh, you come to grief class Wednesday and you'll get some more insights on grief. But there's this little cord. You break it with one hand. But wrap it around a cable, and you can't break it. 
And that's the way it is, my friends. You and I come to God with our dulcimer, little old, tiny old uh, spider web of a cord, and we wrap it around God's goodness and faithfulness. <coughs> that's what faith means. And not just trust. Trust is kind of a weak word. It means that I wrap all that I have of myself about all that I know about God for my strength. Now, the next word, please. Now, when you're up to your neck and alligators, don't forget to drain the swamp. You see, what happens is this. You get in a position where all you do is you're focusing on the alligators. And you really got to walk in there and pull out the plug and take out all the stuff that's mucking it up and get red. And you're being snapped at, you're being charged at, but you, you go in there and you do what you got to do to drink. You've got to have a purpose. If a guy comes to my house and says, Fred, I want to put up a new antenna on your property, I want to make sure he's got an antenna. I don't want to just say, oh, mm, mm, mm. no, he's got to have a purpose for being there. And so, my friend, <coughs> you just go back. So what is your purpose? You know what the purpose is? Let's see. Deuteronomy. The Lord your God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That is your purpose. So when you are surrounded, and when you are struggling with, with skin disease or whatever it is, you cannot forget your purpose. Your purpose is to worship God and to serve and to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's your purpose, my friend. You say, well, I gotta be happy. No, no, no. God didn't call you to be happy. He called you to love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I said to a man one time, as he left his wife. I called him and I said, uh, you wouldn't know him anyway, so I'll give him this whole name. Dick, are you happy? And he said, happier, Pastor. Well, I knew his wife. I think probably his right. <laughs> but my friend, here's, here's the point. Here's the point. God, I've had people say, I'm not happy in my relationship. I'm not happy. You're not supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be pleasing God. You're supposed to be loving God. My wife can't make me happy. Happiness is an attitude of my mind and my heart. She doesn't try to make me happy. She does say to please me. And I'm too thankful for that. I got a pie waiting for me when I get home. <laughs> but my friends, you are being called to love God. That is your purpose. To love God. So whether you, I had pneumonia. Alright, so my purpose is not to go out and build a canoe. My purpose is to love God with a pneumonia. My purpose is to love God with arthritis. My purpose is to love God with whatever. I still want to love God. And that's what we do. Now, here's the thing. Back in those times, we don't do this anymore. This is what people did in Isaiah's time. They had feeble attempts at finding God's way. They looked at signs in the sky tested, and tested the animals and the wind blowing. Let me give you one. They looked at the sky and they said, now what is God's will? Instead of going to the prophet, instead of going to the scriptures, they went to say, oh, the wind is blowing that way. The poles are saying that. Oh, that must be the right thing. Oh, yes, that's God telling us what to do. Or they would take a goat and open it up. I was going to bring chicken livers, but I, I didn't know if I could. I believe in the higher power, and I don't know if that would work. Anyway, anyway my wife had a talk to me out of it. I know she would. But anyway, 
They would cut a door open or an atom and look at those insides and, and however those inwards moved, they knew that was God's will. That's how they learned the will of God. If the guts were moving a certain way, they knew, oh, that's what God wanted. Or they would see the flight of birds. And there are some truth to that. Uh, I've, been, I've been deer hawking. Well, I know when I see a great big flock of black birds, I know that cold weather's coming for some reason. But anyway, they would fly. You know, but what he was saying is there's only one way to really know God's will, and that is to wait upon the Lord. Put your full trust and obedience to him. And you wait by twisting and making strong. You take your little gossip or seed and you twist it. Why can you do that? Because God is sovereign and he is good. His problem, his plan for you is redemption. His whole plan is for you to be in his family. And his promise is Behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. My friends, plan your... Is, are you missing something, man, young man? No, he's going up by me. Oh, you're looking for your dad. I don't blame him. I blame you. <laughs> anyway, uh, but he's making all things new. And he, his plan is redemption. And so whatever, you know, I remember having my first, what was it? Was it, they gave you that shot in the arm. Stirred. You know, you had scar. What did they call that? Was that smallpox or chickenpox? Smallpox. Yeah. You, you people are small pox. my age. You know what I'm talking about. Smallpox. I can show it to you, but I don't think you were interested. But, you know, I had that. I thought my mother was the meanest person in the world. She had me go down to the school, and here was a nurse. <laughs> What a big girl. <laughs> to make pain come over my life like that. And then I had a, a tonsillectomy, and again, my mother took me to all smiles, and it more pain. And I said, what on earth? What kind of a mother makes pain? <coughs> you know why she did that? Because she loved me. She loved me. And she wanted to keep me around a while. And so my friends, but the pain that you're experiencing, whatever, that can be a call to draw it near and twist yourself upon the strong, powerful arms of God. Why? Because he is sovereign and he is good. And he destroyed the power of sin. You do not have to live with lust. You do not have to live with unbridled desires. Jesus Christ can give you the power over those things as you trust him. You can, you can love every brother and sister in the church. You can shake hands with your pastor. You can shake hands with me. You can shake hands with anybody because you love God and he puts a love into your heart so you can do that. And so my friends, I mean the other is he's taken the shroud of our lives now, maybe not now. Maybe you've still got that shroud on your life. Maybe you're the guy who says, oh, I wish I didn't have this skin condition. I wish I didn't have that. But my friends, I'm here to tell you that you wait on the Lord. You put your, you put your whole weight upon the Lord. And you will find the day when he will remove that shroud. You'll sit, you'll experience that. Now, an old grandpa never rode on an airplane before. And they said to him, he flew across the country. He was scared to death about being on a plane. He got to the other end of the place. The old grandpa, they asked him, Grandpa? What did I say old grandpa? There are a lot of old grandpas in here. <laughs> hey, man, I'm talking about myself. And he said, old grandpa, weren't you afraid to fly across the country in an airplane? 
Well, he said, no, I wasn't afraid. He said, I, I just didn't let my weight down <laughs> until I got there. And so, so my friends, <clears throat> let your weight down on Christ. Just give all you have of Christ to all you have. Just, and now we're going to take communion. You know, this is the morning. If you've been sitting around, you haven't decided whether you want to be a Christian or you want to just wonder what you want to do. If you take communion, turn in from your sin, and decide to live a new life and determine to make peace with all your family members, you will come out of here with you will come out of here with goodness and steadiness of life. Well, this is not just a ritual we do. This is not just something we do because of the first of one. This is a spiritual thing where your life can be totally changed forever as you put all your weight upon Christ and the elements that are sure before you. And so I'm going to ask the, the, the people to, uh, the assistants, I don't, I can't exactly remember how your pastor does this, but please, please bear with me, all right? I, I'm doing my very best. And uh, if I'm not doing it right, he won't ask me to do it again. Okay? So if you'll look at the invitation, please. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and humbly kneeling, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Pray with me, please. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. He wants to stay our day and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Lord. Amen. O Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who with great mercy promised forgiveness to all who turn to you with high repentance and true faith, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins, make us strong and faithful in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray with me the collect. Almighty God, God unto whom all the hearts are open, open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take heed, this is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for me, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, and remember to me. Amen. I'm going to ask my sisters to come forward. Please, and they are going to, they are first, 
take the elements, and then I will serve them, and then they will, uh, and I, I believe what you do is you come down these aisles and you go up 